My name is Samuel Gabay. I am a software engineer with Motorola Solutions here in the Boston area. Um, and I want to talk to you today about using C Sharp uh, in IoT. Um, so uh, .NET runs almost everywhere nowadays. Um, in addition to the use cases that you have seen uh, all throughout .NET Conf, um, including web, MAUI, Blazor, desktop, uh, cloud native, um, it also runs on single board computers. So uh, probably the most famous of those would be your Raspberry Pi. Uh, we have others like BeagleBoard. Um, and then it also does run on microcontrollers. So these uh, are the small processing units that power embedded devices, um, such as the Espressif ESP32, uh, which is based off the Extensa uh, design. Um, the microcontrollers based off ARM Cortex-M and controllers based off uh, AVR. So let's go into a little bit about what's the difference between what I'm calling a single board computer and a microcontroller. Uh, so for lack of a better word, your single, con your single board control uh, computer is basically a full computer just in a mini size. Uh, it has a small footprint with moderate processing power. It can be 32-bit or 64-bit. It's more than likely going to be running the ARM instruction set, but they do have someone's, some that are made out of x86. Uh, it runs a full Linux distro, um, but the Raspberry Pi is pretty low cost. And the key thing here is that you're actually able to run the full .NET runtime. Uh, so you can host ASP.NET Core apps, you can run console apps, you can do AOT. Uh, in contrast, your microcontroller, uh, this sort of comes from the embedded devices world. Um, they have minimal footprint less power, they could be 62-bit or 16-bit or 32-bit, um, and they have various instruction sets, again, from that uh, diverse history. And rather than running Linux, um, more than likely, uh, they're going to be running a lightweight RTOS, which stands for Real-Time Operating System. Uh, but what's nice about these is that they're tiny, they're low power, uh, uh, low power consumption, that is, and minimal cost. Um, and so they run a very special version of .NET called Nano Framework. Um, and one thing I do want to uh, emphasize here is that there is not a sharp line between what's a single board computer, what's a microcontroller. As time goes on, that line is blurring more and more. So what is .NET Nano Framework? Uh, so some of y'all may be familiar with .NET Micro Framework. Um, that project sort of went into, for lack of a better word, hibernation around 2017. Uh, but a group of people in Microsoft and the community picked it up and sort of revamped it and came out with .NET Nano Framework. Um, so it is supported by the .NET Foundation. And it includes a compact subset of the most common .NET runtime APIs. Um, one thing that's interesting to note is that it's an interpreter rather than a JIT. And this is one of the things that makes it somewhat easy to run on different boards with different instruction sets because you don't have to write a JIT that can output native code for each of the boards. Uh, but something that, so another interesting thing is that because it's still using Roslyn to compile your code into MSIL, you can use some of the modern C Sharp features as long as they don't depend on framework types that aren't part of Nano Framework. So, for example, you can use file scoped namespaces and top level statements, but you can't use record types because record types do require on, uh, rely on I equitable of T, which isn't present in Nano Framework. Um, and so what you end up having is you have special CLR implementations that are targeted to each specific board or family of boards. And the maintainers and the community are constantly adding additional targets. So again, you end up with two sort of flavors of .NET that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, you have your full .NET runtime. That's what we've been talking about for three days, .NET 8. Um, this has a moderate footprint. It can absolutely run on a single board computer. It only takes you know, a couple ten me tens of megabytes of memory uh, to run a full web app. And you have the entire range of APIs that we use in .NET. Um, on the other hand, .NET Nano Framework is really, really optimized for these tiny memory and low flash uh, devices. So your nano framework can run 
with under a megabyte uh, on devices with under a megabyte of memory. And in order to do this, the trade-off is we have a limited subset of APIs, including your fundamental types, such as uh, your integer types, string, um, types that uh, support threading. And one thing that I'm really appreciative of how much effort that's put in is uh, the networking stack. Um, because oftentimes in the IoT space, you want to connect to the web and be able to either send data, get data, or do both. And there is a really robust networking stack built into Nano Framework. Um, but one thing that both of these uh, editions of .NET share is they have a rich set of NuGet packages that can talk to all si all kinds of uh, sensors and I/O devices. Um, so again, even full .NET runtime running on a Pi can talk to a temperature sensor, humidity, uh, all kinds of stuff, and control things as well. So let's talk a little bit about what I built today to share, or I, I have built to share today, rather. Um, so a little story. Uh, I was always into the sort of platformer games uh, on the PC. And as a child, I had the uh, vaunted Gravis gamepad uh, as my input device. And it's similar to like a Super Nintendo controller or uh, a console controller. And you have your D-pad um, and you have your four buttons. Uh, what's interesting about this is it uses the sort of, it's at this point, very legacy uh, uh, game pad, or I'm sorry, uh, game port interface, which is a 15-pin D sub. Um, and so I have that, uh, uh, and so I had this device, and I, at that same time, I was getting into uh, home automation. And so in our bedroom here, we do have uh, one of those uh, split system ACs, as well as some smart lights. Um, but it was a little bit clumsy because you either had to shout at your smartphone to turn on the lights or uh, use an app. Um, and I thought in the middle of the night, it would be nice to have a tactile some, a device that I can just uh, you know, turn on the light or, or change the temperature. Uh, and so that's where I got in with this idea. Why don't I plug in this uh, gamepad to, uh, to my home automation system? Um, and so again, going back to that, so in my device, I have the uh, gamepad, or in my setup, I have the gamepad here. Uh, this is an interesting port that has digital pins for the buttons, and it has analog pins uh, that references that, that, that do the uh, D-pad because originally it was a joystick which with the full analog range of motion. Um, and now the way, or the, now, the way the D-pad works uh, in the Gravis is that when you're either left or up, it's basically a high impedance state when you're in the middle, medium impedance, when you're to the right or down, it's low impedance state. Um, and this is critical because you need a microcontroller that can read uh, the, analog, uh, the analog state of your device. And out of the box, the Raspberry Pi doesn't have this, um, but most of the smaller microcontrollers do. So we have our Gravis gamepad, and then that is plugged directly into uh, my ESP32-S2 based uh, microcontroller, and that's running net, .NET Nano Framework. So the microcontroller is reading periodically the state of the buttons, looking for changes, and then sending out pulses over Wi-Fi. Um, and the protocol I chose for communication is MQTT. This is a protocol that came around in 1999. It's very lightweight, so it's very highly optimized for IoT devices where you don't need the full overhead of HTTP uh, communication even though um, nowadays uh, with these devices becoming so much more powerful, they can run HTTP stacks just as easily. But it's a good proof of concept we with MQTT. And so finally, uh, you have your Raspberry Pi 4 that's running the full .NET runtime, and that is um, uh, acting as a host or a broker for MQTT. Uh, now, typically in MQTT, you have a device, uh, you have devices, that are publishing method messages and you have other devices that are simply uh, subscribing to those topics. And there isn't necessarily a server that's doing anything with the messages, but that doesn't mean you can't run it that way. Um, and so that's what I've set up is that the Raspberry Pi is essentially acting as a server. And when it sees a message arrive on the topic, it decides to process it as the button presses. Um, And the nice thing about this setup, even though it's a little bit contrived because we have multiple hops, absolutely you could talk 
to the, uh, in this case, Philips Hue API using the ESP32. Um, but it's really nice to do this in the full network framework because you have all the types that you're used to. You have a full rich, you know, HTTP client. You can do retries um, and you can use the Poly library and all that stuff. So it's really nice to be able to the, perform the heavy lifting on the Raspberry Pi and use the uh, microcontroller as your sort of, again, your lightweight beacon. And so here's just a little sort of diagram of what we've got set up. You Again, in your top left, you have your gamepad that's just wired into your uh, microcontroller, which is talking over wireless using MQTT to the Raspberry Pi. And then the Raspberry Pi is sort of decoding those buzz and presses and deciding what to do with your smart bulb. All right, let's switch to the code, please. Can I do this? Or does Maddie have to do it? Thank you. Um, so first thing to talk about uh, is that, let's go to the setup. OK, so here's my setup. Um, here's my game pad, which I've got wired in, again, using the game port. I've got a nice breakout board. Uh, that allows me to just, for prototyping purposes, um, plug it into my microcontroller using these jumper wires. Um, what's a little bit hard to see is I pretty much wired all of the pins directly between the microcontroller and the breakout board, but I do have two little resistors up here, and these are necessary in order to decode the analog values that are coming off of the D-pad. Um, and so that's my microcontroller. It has the ESP2 unit, which has the Wi-Fi antenna, and then, of course, over here is the Raspberry Pi. And even though these are plugged in via USB, they're totally wireless. They're just using the USB for power. Um, so the way that you, the easiest way to get started with micro uh, nano framework is to actually use the Visual Studio Code extension. Um, so I've set up a solution here uh, with my beacon, which is using a nano framework project uh, and my server which is using an ASP.NET Core project. Um, but the cool thing is, again, I go into my uh, Beacon project and my program class, and I've got what looks like modern C-sharp code. I've got top-level statements. I've got uh, file scope namespacing. In this case, I don't have a namespace, but I'm allowed to do that. Um, and basically, what you do is you set up your device to read your various pins, and then you need some sort of loop. So in this case, what I've done is I've set up a timer that will read the state of the buttons every 20 milliseconds. If something interesting happens, it will enqueue uh, onto a simple queue event, and then that um, calls the, the, the function to send the button presses over to the Pi. And the reason I did it this way is the idea is that if the send buttons function is blocking, hopefully the timer can still be reading those button presses and queuing more information. So using uh, the nano framework, extension for Visual Studio, I'm able to actually have first class debugging and deploying experiences. Um, so first things, I'm going to go to my uh, uh, my device explorer, which is this is provided by the extension. I can select my device here. And then I can actually, I'm going to turn this into a bug, I can actually debug my code. And let's make sure I've got that ready to go. Yes. And it's a little hard to see, but the output window, what it's doing, it's actually compiling uh, and packaging the assemblies that need to go over to the microcontroller. Uh, it's erasing the flash um, that contains the user code, and it's sending that over. Now it's going to initialize the debugger, which is very slick. It's doing this all over the USB, so you don't need a separate debugging interface. And if I press, now if I start pressing buttons on my microcontroller or on my pad, you can see that's actually reading those. Again, it's a little hard to see, but what it's doing is it's telling me the state of each button as I press the button down and then as I release it. So let's go and stop that. Now I can go over to my Pi. And I can start up my server. So I've got my server running, um, and this will be ready to listen for those button presses. Uh, 
I need to make a few changes to the code. I had turned off the connection to the server um, for the for, to show you the debugging. I'm going to un, uh, uncomment those lines. I'm going to switch back to release, and instead of using debug, I'm just going to use deploy. So what this will do is it'll flash the code right onto my device for me. And again, this is all provided by the Visual Studio extension. Let's save that first and trust it. So of course, again, that's just writing the flash. It has deployed. I'm going to go ahead and reset my device. And we should see that the server gets a connection request. And there it is. So now the, um, the beacon has connected to the server. One thing to realize about MQTT is this is a stateful connection. So uh, in, unlike HTTP, where you can open and close connections, MQTT is meant to be, or it can, uh, act, uh, it can activate, or can act in a continuously open fashion. Um, so let's see if everything works together. All right. Um, so we've got three pieces. Uh, we have our microcontroller. What you're seeing in the upper uh, left-hand corner, which I forgot to mention, is a little baby Blazor app that's actually being post hosted by the same server that's listening for uh, the, the, the pulses. And this is going to provide feedback that, yes, the Raspberry Pi is indeed um, processing those button presses. And then if all goes well, the light should also turn on. But one thing that you'll notice, there is a multicolored LED. It's not on yet. That should turn on as well as the buttons are getting pressed. And so I can press the button on my device. I can change the color of my lights. I see from the server that, yep, it's seeing those. And of course, the light is changing. I can use my up and down buttons. And I can change. Now, forgive me that uh, the, the webcam uh, pointed towards the light ha is keep trying to do white balancing, but it's supposed to be changing the uh, intensity up and down. Um, so yeah, let's go back to the slides, please. Um, so yeah, that uh, was my presentation. I have a few resources uh, to share. Um, obviously, if you're interested uh, in, in uh, IoT on, on .NET, check out the great documentation over at uh, on the .NET website. Of course, uh, the Nano Framework has their own um, site with great information. Uh, an excellent documentation about the different boards they support. Um, and then the, the source code for this project is available on my GitHub. Um, so feel free to check that out. And uh, with that, I am happy to take some questions. Cool, that was amazing. And I was like, is that his desk that he's showing? <laughs> I was like, oh my God, it is. Very cool. Um, sorry, I was reading through the questions, so I had Absolutely. to scroll back up time. and find your slides. But um, cool. So let's see. Boop, 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 boop. All right. So there were a bunch of just like, this is cool. Surpri not su unsurprising. <laughs> um, and then uh, there was one question. Can Nano Framework run directly on a Raspberry Pi? Um, I don't actually know if Nano Framework has a target built for uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, but what's the, the nice thing about it is um, that a lot of the code that you would want to write on your microcontroller, you can just copy and paste and run it in um, .NET, uh, full .NET runtime. Um, honestly, if it were me, I would want to use the full .NET uh, runtime on my Pi just because I get my JIT, I get my full uh, framework, I can run you know, a web page very easily. I can run ASP.NET Core apps 
Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know to answer the question exactly whether Network Framework has a target for the Pi. Yeah, but you know what? .NET it, why not? So yeah. um, what about will .NET Core Framework run on, work on RevPy as well? So I think this means .NET Core, not .NET Framework. Yes, good question. Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with the RevPy. Is that a version of the Raspberry Pi? So um, you would know. You're the IoT expert. Good question. Yeah. Um, good question. I don't know what the RevPy is. Um, it, uh, just a, a, a very brief Google. It looks like it is based on Raspberry Pi, in which case you could just run your full .NET runtime. Yeah, .NET Core. Sweet. .NET 8. Very cool. And then we'll do, this is the last one. Does Nano Framework implement any .NET standard? That's a very good question. Um, as of yet, it does not, to my understanding. And that's cool. because uh, .NET standard does require quite a few APIs, even not standard 1.0. Uh, and so it makes it a tiny bit tricky to share code between a .NET uh, runtime or a full .NET project and .NET um, Nano because of that limitation. Um, but they're consistently adding more and more APIs, um, as it makes sense, of course, to Nano Framework. Um, and so at some point, maybe it will uh, support an early .NET standard. Sweet. And then will the VS Code tools upload the code directly to the devices, or are there separate tools you were using? Yeah, so good question. I was using um, a Visual Studio, the full Visual Studio. And the uh, Visual Studio extension does upload the code directly to the device. It flashes it. Um, my understanding is there is a Visual Studio code extension. Um, it's one thing that I think they're working on getting more and more functional. I was not able to get it to run on my Mac. Um, I think I had some conflicts with other existing installations of Mono um, that prevented that from happening. But there is something coming out. I think it's still in preview. But once that's um, released, you'll be able to develop .NET uh, Nano Framework Core or .NET Nano Framework projects on any platform using Visual Studio Code. Um, and as part of that, there, I, I, I'm certain there will be uh, um, commands that, that do provide for automatically compiling and uploading the code to your device. Sweet, very cool. So question for me, where, how far outside of Boston are you? <laughs> Good question, I am in Somerville. No way. Yeah. You'll have to come by the Microsoft office in Cambridge sometime. Uh, very cool. I'd love to. Anytime you want, let me know. I I work from there, but in COVID days, it's like once a week I roll in at lunchtime and then I dip before traffic gets too bad. So I'm in Revere. So Oh, very nice. Yeah. Cool. So we're for y'all who don't know the greater Boston area, we're just about five, six miles away from each other. Yeah. Five, um, six miles in about an hour and a half if it's yeah, traffic. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I think I heard on our radio station today. Uh, fourth worst traffic in the world, not the country. So yep, that sounds about right. That sounds like us. So Manny, well, I'm cool. Thank you so more. much for may joining I, us. I'm sorry. Oh. May I answer one more question? I'm noticing yeah. coming in repeated. I've seen a couple of people asking, "Can you run on ASP e ESP32?" I sh I did show an ESP32 based microcontroller. Um, uh, a person asked, "Can it run on uh, Arduino?" And absolutely. Uh, cool. mo uh, many different um, targets are supported. So if you're interested, if it's uh, valid for your use case or you device, your device, go to .NET Nano Framework and see if they've got a target for it. Sweet. I think a lot of people do like ESP32 because it, it has built-in Wi-Fi, but there's many, many targets. Cool. Love it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. Uh, stick around. We have an amazing session coming up. Samuel, I'm going to let you go. Enjoy the thank rest of your day. Thank you very much.